morning, everyone. Uh, for those that don't know, my name is Claire Mersall. I'm a longtime member and currently the financial secretary. Uh, and today's moment of focus is from Radical Love, an introduction to queer theology by Patrick Cheng. Queer theology can be understood as a theological method that is self-consciously transgressive, especially by challenging societal norms about sexuality and gender. Thus, queer theology refers to a way of doing theology that brings down the powerful and lifts up the lowly. In particular, this theology seeks to unearth silenced voices or hidden perspectives. Queer theologians have used queer theology to challenge not only the fluidity of sexual and gender boundaries, but also the boundaries relating to Christian theology itself. Indeed, Christian theology is, as I have suggested, fundamentally a queer enterprise. This is the time in our gathering where we extend the invitation to you to take part in the life of the church through the act of giving. If you feel so led as to share your resources with Chesterland UCC, you can do that one of three ways. You can uh, use the QR code that is found in your bulletin. You can mail it in, snail mail. Or if you want to, uh, actually, I think I forgot to bring the bowl down. If you just want to hand me your cash directly, I think that'll... <laughs> that'll work. It'll be fine. Don't worry. No, nope. um, we will. But if you, if you want to give on your way out today, yeah, we'll, we'll make a bowl. Um, but with that, would you please join me? And there's our bowl in an attitude of prayer or meditation for our offering blessing. Healing one, we bring our offerings with thanks. Your grace goes before us and makes even the most painful wounds, potential sites for new life. We pray that whenever we are called to account for harm done as individuals, as the church, or as extensions of legacies of violence, such as racism, that we would show up with honesty, repentance, and a fierce commitment to transformation that is lasting and restorative. May it always be so among us. Amen. Howdy, folks. For those who don't know, my name is Lou. Today we're going to be reading Genesis 45, 1 through 15. <laughs> then Joseph was no longer able to hold back his feeling in front of his attendants, and he cried out to them, Leave me. So no one was present when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. But he wept so loudly that all of his Egyptians' attendants heard him, and the news of it reached the Pharaoh's palace. Joseph said to his brothers, It is I, Joseph, still alive. So dumbfounded were they. Then Joseph said to the brothers, Come closer to me. When they had come closer, he said to them, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold in Egypt. Please don't rebuke yourselves for having sold me here. 
God sent me here ahead of you so that I could save your lives. There has been famine in the land for two years, and for the next five years there will be no tilling and no harvesting. But God sent me ahead of you to guarantee that you will have descendants on earth and to keep you alive as a great body of survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. God has made me Pharaoh's chief counselor, the head of his household and governor of all Egypt. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is I who speak to you. Report to our father about how I am honored here in Egypt and about everything you have seen. Go quickly now and bring my father to me. Joseph threw his arms around Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him and wept too. Then he kissed his brothers, weeping over them as well. And then he and his brothers talked. So if this passage featuring Joseph and his brothers sounds familiar to you, other than being the plot of a very popular musical. Um, it might be because I used this passage uh, in a message from about a year ago where I discussed the idea of queer theology uh, or the process of queering theology. And it was that message and another one I did on sex and eroticism but those two messages have been re-requested by several people over the past year. And so I thought um, Pride Weekend would be a great time to revisit this message on queer theology and queer representation within uh, the, the Bible. Because what a difference a year makes. This past year has seen an explosion of legis legislation aimed at literally criminalizing queer culture. The Ohio legislature alone has introduced a spate of anti-queer, anti-trans, and anti-drag bills. And we have seen an alarming uptick in violence aimed at the LGBTQ plus community. And we have seen conservative groups and individuals attacking anything with a rainbow on it. Who knew the rainbow could be so offensive? And while it's always been bad for the queer community within this country, in the last several years, the world has drastically changed for the worse, at least in my opinion. And the name of the game, particularly within the queer, or for, uh, aimed at the queer community is twofold. The first is erasure, or creating policies that eliminate queer people from cultural participation, such as the anti drag laws, and straight washing, which is the process of portraying queer people as straight, whether that is like maybe in a movie biography of someone, or whether it's from a historical standpoint, how historians talk. You always hear, oh, they were lifelong roommates. <laughs> and these attempts to erase queer people are, they're nothing new, but it may be an overdrive right now, but it has always been with us. And not surprisingly, these acts of erasure and straightwashing have occurred amongst biblical historians and biblical literary scholars as well. Shocking, I know. But not for everyone. Uh, queer theologian Nancy Wilson, she argues in her book, and it's a really good book. I highly recommend it. It's called Our Tribe... Queer Folks, God, Jesus, and the Bible. Really good. She argues that relationships within scripture, such as the ones between David and Jonathan, Ruth and Naomi, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, that these relationships can and should be viewed uh, through the lens of queer dynamics. She calls these people within the Bible are, are gay, or these passages in the Bible are gay and lesbian tribal texts. The relationship between David and Jonathan in the Hebrew Bible is particularly explicit. With the book of 2 Samuel attributing these words to David after Jonathan dies. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. The Hebrew Bible also tells us that Jonathan fell in love with David at first sight. When David sees Jonathan, or when Jonathan uh, sees David for the first time, this is what scripture says. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David upon their first meeting. 
And their story gets more chapters in the Bible than any other human love story. David was said to have even gone on to adopt Jonathan's son after Jonathan died. Because they were very good roommates. Lifelong. But what unfortunately happens is that this queer coding within scripture gets lost amidst generations Thousands of years of heteronormative interpretations. And since today I want to talk about not only um, queer theology, but queering theology, we're using the story of Joseph and his family. So we read a bit of this familiar story for our scripture passage today, but here's the lens through which many of us have been taught to view this narrative, right? So Joseph was a child uh, who was spoiled by their father, and Joseph is favored at the expense of their brothers. And Joseph perhaps has an ego, a power complex, as a result of their father's favoritism. Joseph does no labor, Joseph contributes little, and Joseph focuses only upon their own needs. Again, this is what we're taught to view. And this prompts bitterness from Joseph's brothers who shockingly sell Joseph into slavery. They human traffic Joseph. And a few years later, famine hits the land. And of course, Joseph's family is not immune to the famine and its devastating consequences. And so the family is forced to go to Egypt in hopes of finding food and other resources for their survival. Now, during this time, unbeknownst to, his, uh, to their family, Joseph has risen to power and now works basically as the right-hand person of Pharaoh. And when Joseph's brothers come looking for food, they come to Joseph, but they don't recognize Joseph as the person who was their b- brother. And Joseph, seemingly struggling with their own ambivalence toward their brothers, Joseph does interest, I mean, acts very strangely. First, Joseph treats them horrendously on the one hand, and then with great care and attention on the other. If you know the full story, Joseph imprisons them, accuses them of being spies, but also feeds them well and, and provides for them and protects them. And also during this time, Joseph struggles with keeping their identity a secret until that is our text for this week, because Joseph can hold their secret no longer. Joseph is overwhelmed with emotion, sends everyone but their family away and tells ever wondered why the brothers don't recognize Joseph, their very own brother, their flesh and blood? Eye makeup. Eye makeup, yes. (laughs) Maybe. Now, there are attempts at explaining this question, and there are historical uh, considerations as well. Some argue that it was 22 years before the brothers saw Joseph again. Uh, And so he would have obviously aged and perhaps been difficult to recognize. Some people argue the living in the desert factor that sort of deteriorates the skin faster. So maybe Joseph became two-faced in the few years that it took to to meet them, uh, like horribly scarred or something. Or some suggest that the fear of the brothers like their, their fear of being in the throne room blinded them to who was in front of them. Like their anxiety was so great that they just couldn't see what was right in front of them. And there, there are other explanations as well. But the question of why Joseph is not recognized by his brothers is, no matter what your explanation is, it's an important one to ask. Because there is a reading of this narrative that creates something of a radically different understanding of the identity and personality of Jesus. If you've heard this message before, don't spoil it for the people who haven't. So rather than the character of Joseph being read as spoiled or lazy or entitled, as is often the case, a queer lens or a queer reading might paint Joseph 
simply as some of us are less oriented toward the hard physical labor of their brothers. And what's interesting here is that Joseph's interests in what we might call the softer or more artistic or even the queerer side of life, the very things that enraged his brothers, it was those things that saved Joseph's life later in the story, such as dreaming and interpreting. Joseph, Joseph's brothers hated him because that's, he just sort of went about his day dreaming and interpreting the dreams and being a bit of an artist. Those skills are what saved him. They enraged his bro their brothers, but those skills saved them. And because they were less adept at labor, perhaps this increased Joseph's feelings of vulnerability around their brothers, making Joseph feel, uh, seem different or odd. When I was growing up, I was not the, the, the typical, like, raw boy, you know? I, I, you know, I had a little bit more of a, of, a, of a softer side, a little bit more of an ar artistic side. And I would always feel so awkward around, you know, people my age who were the athletes, which was pretty much almost everyone else. So perhaps Joseph, you know, his sense of awkwardness was increased because of that. But interestingly, earlier in Joseph's story, we see that Joseph's father recognized this about Joseph. Joseph's father didn't share Joseph's brother's opinions about what Joseph was doing. And his, uh, Joseph's father, the compassion for his vulnerable son, and keep in mind, this is very important as well, scripture describes Joseph as beautiful. Not handsome, not attractive, beautiful. And so perhaps Joseph's father was overprotective of Joseph, recognizing the violence that Joseph could be susceptible to and was susceptible to as someone who might be perceived as a bit more tender or perhaps a bit more feminine. And this could have translated into preferential treatment in the eyes of Joseph's brothers. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the famous coat, the coat of many colors, the Technicolor dream coat, which was made for Joseph by their father. And the Hebrew is not coat. The word for this, this beautiful, you know, I, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Garment. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Everyone just did that. Okay. You couldn't have planned that. Um, this beautiful garment is not, the Hebrew word is not coat at all. It is princess dress. The Hebrew for the coat of many colors is princess dress. Now, why is this important? Well, if we are going to discuss queer dynamics and potentially queer representation within Scripture, then it is obviously very important. There is considerable writing and research around the very real possibility that the literary figure of Joseph could have been written by the author as transgender or gender variant. Whether we're talking about the reasons I just stated or even how within the story, you know, our big question, how were the brothers unable to recognize Joseph? Well, perhaps this had to do with Joseph's appearance changing considerably if they had made a decision to live as a woman or even gender fluid. And keep in mind, within the story, Joseph is secondhand to Pharaoh. Pharaohs, uh, many Pharaohs were very famous for gender bending. And so that culture, Joseph would have been living in. Um, or even the clue of, uh, of Joseph sending their attendants away before re revealing their hidden identity. Or how in the story, Joseph rejects the sexual advances of Potiphar's wife. All of this suggests Joseph being written as transgender or gender fluid is not a far-fetched concept at all. 
Now, a queer lens is important with it, with, uh, within big biblical scholarship because reading Joseph as transgender or gender variant adds a new dimension and a fresh layer to this famous story and representation, even within Scripture. Well, especially within Scripture, representation is important. And this analysis can be uh, applied to many figures within Scripture. You know, I mentioned David and Jonathan, Ruth and Naomi and others, but it can even be applied to God. Despite some folks' belief that God is somehow a dude with a big white beard, you know, intelligently stroking, watching things and saying, I'm going to make that person president, but I'm going to let that child die of cancer. Some people think that that's what God does, but we see throughout scripture that God is referred to in terms that are both masculine and feminine. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 15, Moses and God are speaking and Moses said, if this is how you are going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me, which is a great relationship to have with God. But (laughs) in the Hebrew text, the you in the sentence, if this is how you are going to treat me, the you is feminine. Moses was referring to God in uh, as a female in the feminine sense as a woman or at least the writer was. And that's not an anomaly. It happens regularly within the Bible. In places like 1 Corinthians and 1 Peter, we see allusions to God breastfeeding their followers. A common term for God is El Shaddai, which means breasted one. The name Yahweh, however, is masculine. So the God in the Bible is literally transgender. In the Hebrew Bible, God speaks of having labor pains. And the Apostle Paul paints a picture of a God whose gender rapidly shifts. Paul has God all over the spectrum. Uh, A woman in labor, to a nurse weaning, to a mother weaning. uh, God being described as a father, to being a father and mother simultaneously. And so it becomes clear very quickly that the concept of gender fluidity was not exactly a foreign concept to biblical writers. Now, while identifying queer representation within, within scripture is important, just as important is the process, like I said earlier, of queering scripture itself. And when I say queering scripture, what I'm talking about is breaking the Bible out of preconceived molds of interpretation, and identifying bad or hurtful or outmoded theologies, which then opens up scripture to more transformative possibilities. And so a biblical story with a potentially queer character is actually a great place to talk about queering scripture itself. And I'm gonna be bringing it home here, so I told you it was gonna be long today. But the story of Joseph progresses and Joseph reveals to their brothers their theological understanding of how they see God. Okay, so we just talked about representation, queer representation. Now we're going to actually queer some theology that Joseph shares. Because despite Joseph's previous wishy-washiness regarding whether their brothers needed punished or forgiven, Joseph goes on to suggest that the brothers, they don't need to feel remorse for what they did. They don't need to be sorry for what they did. Why? Well, this is what Joseph says. Quote, God sent me before you to preserve life and that it was not you who sent me here, but God. So what is Joseph's theological perspective here? Well, it's actually one that a lot of people hold and that largely goes unquestioned by many religious people today, not just Christians, but across the religious board. And that is that the terrible and painful things that we go through, whether they be job losses, uh, natural disasters, sexual assaults, back alley abortions, children being murdered in their own classrooms, all of these are somehow God testing us or preparing us 
for something better. All the bad stuff that happens in our life is God preparing us for something better. Raise your hand if you've heard that, if you've been told that. It's pretty much a common theological understanding amongst a lot of people. And Joseph goes on to suggest that God is in the business of placing the people God wants in positions of power in those positions. And, but, which is also a very common belief amongst people. But if, I mean, and I don't think I need to explain to too many people here why it's a problematic theology, but if our theology says that God is in the business of placing people in positions of power, what does our historical Western patterns of power then say about God? Perhaps that God prefers white men in charge? That God is warmongering? That God has little interest in those who are the And Republican or Democrat, okay? I'm not just picking on the conservatives here. Democrats go to war just as easily as Republicans do. And in a world where abusers are so often excused for their actions, both legally as well as in the court of public opinion, erasing the blame of Joseph's abusers in the name of God's long-term plan does nothing helpful to, uh, uh, to advance positive transformation or forgiveness. You can forgive and people still suffer the consequences for their actions. So in other words, if God's plan requires pain and suffering, here's the biggest question of all, then why fight for justice at all? If God's plan requires suffering, then why work toward the elimination of suffering? Are we working against God when we seek to alleviate pain and suffering and injustice? Because if God wants it there to make us grow, then we are, by default, working against God's plans. But that's ridiculous, right? I mean, the idea that God wants us in pain. In a religion where God is often understood as a figure who can control and manipulate the universe in order to achieve a desired outcome, Joseph's interpretation of God's will in this way opens up a whole bag of theological worms about God and God's relationship with humanity. And so when we read a story such as Joseph's, it's on us to view it through lenses that disrupt abuses of power, lenses that lead us to healing and accountability, not excusing someone's violent behavior, whether on the part of Joseph's brothers or anti-gay churches or our legislators or family members. Through a queer lens, I believe that the divine spirit ultimately reveals a different kind of power, the kind that brings communities together not the kind of power that seeks to exclude or hurt or dominate or to marginalize or the kind of power that secures authority through division and hate. God's power is the kind of power that does not justify pain and suffering in the name of a divine plan, but it's the kind of power that transforms and heals and comforts and demands justice, demands an end to oppression, demands an end to suffering. Queering scripture reveals that God is not the cause of pain and suffering, but that God is with us through the pain and the suffering. Now, last Sunday, I encouraged folks to send me any queer theology or, you know, LGBTQ plus questions to integrate into this week's message, because I, I just didn't want to do the exact same message that I did last year. And, you know, it's probably about 75 the same, and I, you know, I updated a little bit. Um, but there was one question that um, I, I just couldn't figure out how to, how to shoe, shoehorn in. But the third, um, I just wanted to address 
to all of you and open the floor to see if anyone else has, because it's a great question. And I figured we'd take some time to discuss it together or any other issues that you might have. And the question was this, how can the LGBTQ plus community protect itself if Trump gets elected? That was the question. Now, I honestly don't think this is simply a Trump issue. Biden's been president for the last three and a half years, and we've seen unprecedented state and local level attacks on the queer community. So really, I'm not sure it entirely matters who is uh, president, because queer bodies are in danger right now with a Democratic president. But to answer the question, we protect ourselves how we always have. Community, solidarity, activism, being seen, not hiding. For allies, I think one of the most important things that we can do is education. I've spoken to a lot of hetero allies who still are not aware of just how bad it's gotten for us queer folk out there after the last several years. So please, if you are an ally, educate yourself so you can better support your queer friends. That helps to keep your queer friends safe. The more And also for allies, this is the big one. Speak up. If you hear a coworker, or a friend, or a family member talking in a homophobic manner, gently address that with them. Explain that you have queer friends, family members, and that those words are harmful to them and to yourself as well. So let's open the floor. Does anyone else have any potential ideas of how as um, uh, the queer community allies within that community, how we can continue to better protect ourselves. Anybody have any ideas? And if we have anything on Zoom, uh, raise, your, raise your hand. And if you don't, that's fine. I just wanted to open the floor. Lisa? I just wanted... It should be. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to say um, I loved all of your ideas, and I think those are the things to concentrate on because protecting and safety are very different things. Mm-hmm. I don't think, my mom and I were just talking about this morning, I don't think we can be safe. Um, I don't think we are anyway um, in this world now. So safety, um, if that's what you're looking for, really I don't feel is possible. So the more we do all the things you're talking about, it can protect us personally as to where we are Mm -hmm. because we do need to just keep doing the work even though it's not safe. Right. But we also can create safe zones, Yes, you know, with with people and communities that we know that we can let our guard down, we can be ourselves. But perhaps culturally, no, we are not safe. Absolutely. Kathy. Well, I'm going back to Malcolm X, what he said. Great. Just know each other. And that's Mm. what the Pride event does. It it provides a situation that people can talk to each other. Yeah. And, and know each other, and I, that's the only way I know. Great, yes, no, absolutely. Communication, getting to know people, finding out more about uh, your friends and, and neighbors, and the more we know of each other, the closer our bonds become, and as our bonds become closer, we want to look out for one another. Yeah, Catherine. I think, uh, I think letting people know that the more you speak out, the less worrisome it is, and helpful to other people to see people speak out. Mm-hmm. I don't care who it is. I really found that in my life. It really Absolutely. makes a difference. And courage is contagious. You know, there might be someone who needs to see an example of someone being courageous in protecting uh, a friend or even just st- uh, standing up for themselves as a queer person. You know, courage is contagious. Uh, what is also contagious is fear and despair. Right. So the more we lean into one or the other, that's what we're going to perpetuate. Did, did I? Oh, Jim. Yeah, I thought I saw a hand. Recently, I moved with my late wife into a retirement community. Very borderline. I mean, it's conservative. Mm-hmm. And about when the, our church got bombed, I'm the only member of community church that lives there. Mm. 
Old South has about 15 or 20 people oh, do in they? the community, okay. and they're, they're a big presence. And so everybody refer. oh, that's Jim's church, that's Jim's church, when, when we got bombed. Yeah, anyway. yeah. And then I'm a member of a small uh, devotional group, which is very conservative. Mm. And I have made it known that I believe what you believe mm. in, in, in the group. And in the beginning, oh, anyway, it's a long story, but they've accepted me as and then Brenda passed away in March, and 20 or 30 people came to the Celebration of Life mm -hmm. service here. Now, well, Jim f could help us with this. His church is it, it's sort of people from the Old South said, oh, we stand with you. We yeah. look up to you. Yeah. So it's, it's, you're right. You have to pursue the education. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Jim, for sharing that. And thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Meg. Oh, that's okay. Everything you just said, Jim, I am in love with. Thank you for saying that. Um, I think it's about, we have to put in our, ourselves in a position to believe lived experiences. Mm. And we do have to talk about the hard things. Mm. And we have to talk about it out loud. And we have to talk about it with people who are in different camps than us mm -hmm. because of that right there. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many people I talked to yesterday that have li are living better lives because yep. we make it safe in public. So how we protect our friends and how the LGBTQ community can be safe in spite of whoever is elected is if we keep saying out loud that these people are welcome and loved. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. Yeah. It's the, it's absolutely the only way yep. because we are at the end of the day, the, the local, the local environment matters. The local environment is where people live. Mm -hmm. And when local people get involved with their local government mm -hmm. and the processes and the decisions that are being made, then you get to see changes. If you don't get involved and you continue to think that then other people are going to make those changes, they're not going to, and we're going to end up in a place like we are now. Right. We become complacent. You have to get involved. You have to vote. You have to run, and you have to show up. And, and uh, if, if we don't know by now that our leaders really don't have our best interests in mind and we have to keep their feet to the fire, if we haven't learned that by now, we need to learn that. Uh, activism, letter writing, phone calls, uh, pressuring our leader because our leaders won't do anything uh, that they feel could be controversial they won't do anything that might lose them a few points uh and until in dollars uh and it, it's on us to hold their feet to the fire do we have anyone else in person who wanted to contribute anything yes, yes. oh uh claire oh i'm sorry <laughs> i was just thinking about re-educating our educators mm. um i met d when Owen was three and Aiden was five and we started going to pride right then and there mm -hmm. but their classroom experiences have been contrary like mm. we had a well-intending teacher when Owen was in first grade who thought she was being helpful but she was hurtful because they were having a unit on families and instead of saying families are made always she said it's okay if yeah your family is different yeah and he was targeted because of that yeah. and and then i also think of um the way we've brought our children up that people are people um when addison kindergarten realized there were people with different color skin hmm until it was Black History Month mm -hmm. and her teacher read a story and pointed out. Yeah. And she's like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. And I, I always laugh about um, Aiden was in eighth grade and he went to Washington, D.C. And Long story, sorry. No, you're fine. He went to Washington, D.C. on a class trip and he laughed because in the gift shop they had a Statue of Liberty, which is in New York, but gifted by France. Mm -hmm. And it was in a gift shop in Washington, D.C., and it was made in China. <laughs> right? So like all these things. And I said, wow, the only thing good that really came out of China is your cousin Zoe. And all three kids looked at me and they're like, wait, what? I go, Zoe, she's adopted. 
from China. And Addie goes, oh, that's why. And I was, I had this moment <laughs> where, like, she's going to say she looks different. She goes, that's why she's got all those China clothes. Because <laughs> Zoe gifted all of her authentic clothing to Addison when she was little. And she loved it. Mm. So, like, kids just see beauty in everyone mm -hmm. until they're taught otherwise. Yep. And, and a lot of that comes from home. But the majority of their time is spent in school. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Like we need to educate our educators. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that story just reminded me of a, something I saw on social media. It said a, 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 a gay guy went to his uh, went to his brother's house and his nephew goes, uh, 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 Uncle Bob, why aren't you married? And he goes, well, well, he goes, why, aren't, why don't you have a wife? And he goes, oh, because I, I, I like men. And he goes, why don't you have a husband? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have anyone else in person? Oh, yeah. I would just follow up on what you said about the, the educators. Uh, I've been attending the Minner school boards, mm. and um, <laughs> we need to be aware that there is a, a cohort in the school boards showing up actively gay bashing, actively trans bashing, actively trying to straight wash mm -hmm. every aspect of our education. And if we don't start showing up at our school boards, what we do in the legislature is going to be irrelevant because mm -hmm. we will brainwash the kids. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it, it becomes imperative that we show up, as, as Meg said. We have to show up at places like school board meetings, for God's sake. Yeah. Yep, thank you. And one of the reasons that's so important is because they're going to take the, like, w with, like, particularly with local politics, but politics in general, politicians are going to take the path of least resistance, right? So if you're, on a, if you're on a school board and you're sort of like, well, you don't have any problem with the LGBTQ community, but I have all these people screaming at me that if uh, we put these books in the library, they're, you know, they're going to kill our dog, you know, um, that might you know, help you decide to take the path of least resistance, right? So it's important for voices to be heard. Teresa? Um, and just to second um, what you just said about the school board, just in general, attending school board meetings is important because it helps ally educators be allies. Mm. You know, it doesn't stop us from allowing our kids to be themselves or our colleagues. I have a colleague right now that's transitioning, and they have been experiencing things that I would have thought my colleagues could be better. Yeah. And not respecting pronouns. Like, that's the easiest thing you could do. Just yeah. use the right pronoun. Yeah. And, you know, attending those meetings so that way we have people in power that can support us with the right materials, the right resources. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, not to talk about our community, but there is a school board member in our community that I am very concerned about, not just straight washing but also whitewashing mm. the curriculum like we need to teach kids how to be better overall mm -hmm. not just for now mm -hmm. not just for within their own community within the entire community yeah, yeah. So. and i saw tyler's head nodding as a fellow teacher so <laughs> i think you got confirmation uh, as a teacher anyone else in person do we have anything on Zoom? Any okay, all right. Well, thank you all for that. I love it when we can open the floor and everyone can, can contribute. Rise up today and stand as one in loving unity. Let's recognize each child of God created beautifully, engraved upon God's loving hands, each one of us by name, completely known and loved by God, each beating heart the same.
reach out to their all humanity, for we define the church. May we look inward at the heart to see each person's worth. Our loving kindness brings great hope to those who deep despair. We're called to be the light of Christ, a beacon everywhere. For some the day has now arrived, the truth no longer hides. The chain of hopelessness and fear replaced by joy and pride. May we look up together strong, embracing human hearts, proclaiming God's great love for all with freedom to sexuality Christ died for all and welcomes all into eternity Beloveds the divine spirit goes with us into the messiness of this life, extending to us peace in the midst of what is unfinished or untidy, unclear or unresolved. With steadfast patience, let us go from here, encouraged in the hard work of love, pressing on through complexities and staying present to the troubles that call for our attention within us, between us and around us. Blessed be our journeys of queerness, of healing, and of transformation. May it be so. May we make it so. May you continue to have a wonderful month of pride, and may you have a wonderful week and a wonderful Father's Day. Take care, everyone. Amen. Amen.